please remain standing and take your hymnals and turn to number 788. Now thank we all our God, number 788. Today is entitled, Please and Thank You. And the text that we'll be looking at is that portion that we read out of the book of Psalms just a few moments ago. A very important text as it relates to thanksgiving and praise of God. And as you're taking your Bibles and turning there to that portion of scripture, let me mention one other thing about the conference that is coming up on December 2nd. Each of you should have a copy of this little flyer in your bulletins today, uh, beautifully done. And uh, this is not merely so that you can look at it, take it home, put it in the wastebasket. Please, these are designed for each of us to have an opportunity for spreading the gospel of Christ. You know some place, probably in your neighborhood, uh, which would be willing to put this either on their public bulletin board or perhaps in their front window and you can help with advertising this conference so that others will hear the truth of God's word. It's an interesting topic, I think. Genetics according to Jesus. Dr. Robert Carter is one of the world's leading creation research scientists in the field of genetics. It is astounding that we were able to get him. And in God's sovereign plan, there are no accidents, but the world would say it was a freak event that happened so that we were able to get him. He was completely booked during September 
as were all the other CMI speakers and speakers from uh, Ken Ham's Answers in Genesis and uh, speakers from a Creation Ministry up in North Jersey and from ICR. We couldn't get anybody back in September when we normally have our Creation Conference, even though I had been working on it for almost a year at that point. And uh, we've already got our speaker lined up for 2013 because it has become a very growing demand for creation science speakers. Dr. Carter was scheduled here in December on the weekend of December 1st and 2nd at Calvary Chapel up in Marlton. And so they're having him all day Saturday and having him Sunday morning, but suddenly Sunday evening became available. I got an email this past week which was sent out to everybody in this area that's on CMI's mailing list saying, do you know any place where Dr. Carter could speak on Sunday evening? So of course immediately I responded and he was still available and so he will be coming from Marlton in the morning to us in the evening. Uh, this is a, an outstanding scientist. You can ask him any questions you want, especially in the field of genetics and he will know the answers and be able to give them to you. We've invited all the homeschool basketball teams that play in our gymnasium. There are 65 or 70 young people, uh, and the coaches uh, seem agreeable to that. So we're looking forward to a good turnout of young people that evening. And we hope that you will also encourage your friends and neighbors to come as well. Uh, Dr. Uh, Carter was uh, a Christian, but an evolutionist as he was going through school and he began to realize that there was a conflict between what the Bible said and what he was studying in his science classes. And when he began to understand what the true basis for all of creation was and why creation is as it is now, he not only became truly a Christian, but he became a very outspoken creationist. And so we invite you to please join with us on Sunday evening, December 2nd, 7 o'clock p.m., and please be in prayer that God will bring exactly the right people. I've sent out uh, all kinds of news releases to all of the major media in this area, radio stations, magazines, uh, the newspapers that surround us here, even the Philadelphia Inquirer. We're praying that God will give us some good coverage for this conference. Please be in prayer about it, that the right people will see those ads, will respond, and will attend. Now take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of text that we read a few moments ago. Please and thank you, Psalm 69, 30 through 36. I want to read that text once again. I will praise the name of God with a song. As you know, last week we began a series on the names of God. So it's very appropriate that this is the text that we have today. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bullock that hath horns and hooves. The humble shall see this and be glad and your heart shall live that seek God. And then down to verse 36. The seed also of his servants shall inherit it, and they that love his name. I hope you're getting this emphasis. They that love his name shall dwell therein. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we look into your word once again today, we pray that you will fill our hearts with praise and thanksgiving. You are the great and mighty and majestic God. We should magnify your name. Teach us to have truly thankful hearts that is expressed through the way in which we speak and the way in which we live. Thank you, Father, for this time. Bless your word to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, those of you who grew up in traditional homes will remember that our parents taught us certain things at a very early age. After learning the basics like Dada and Mommy, and beginning to identify with our own name, probably the first thing we remember is the word no. 
Now, raising 13 children has left an indelible impression on my mind on the power of the words, that's a no-no. Have you ever heard that? That's a no-no. That's a no-no. As the child begins to crawl toward the object and reach for it, you say, that's a no-no. The child very soon learns that no-nos are things that they must not touch. Now, of course, our children, like I'm sure your children or grandchildren, didn't always obey when they were told something was a no-no. In fact, we discovered that frequently they did not obey, but that merely moved us as parents to step number two in God's plan for rearing children. Discipline. Discipline was swift, loving, memorable, and left a definite impression on the mind of the child, which we would have to reinforce from time to time as the child was tempted to cross the boundary line of that word, no. The mind of the immature child responds much more readily to loving discipline than it does to reason. And I'm giving this background because I want us to understand the context of please and thank you in this psalm. The context of thanksgiving to the God who has given us all things. Let me illustrate that business of discipline versus reasoning. My mother recounted to me on numerous occasions the following story. When I was a little child of about three or four years old, my mother had a very precious, very delicate, and very expensive figurine. She had told me in no uncertain terms that this was a no-no and that I was not to touch it. Now you can probably guess sort of at least the middle of this story. But the temptation was there in reach of my little hands. One day, I decided to pick it up and look at it more closely. As I turned it around and around, somehow in the process, I broke one of the arms. I was instantly mortified, of course, and uh, wondered just how I would explain that to my mom and what she would do. She came in, she saw the damage, but she decided at that point to use some positive modern psychological rubbish that she had been reading. So instead of taking me and spanking me as I deserved, she decided to reason with me. She sat me down. She told me how much the figurine meant to her. She told me where she had gotten it. She told me how valuable it was and how now it was unbalanced since one of those tiny little arms had been broken off. I think it was the figurine of a ballerina. That idea of unbalanced somehow grabbed hold of my juvenile mind. And with all seriousness, I looked up at her and said, let's break the other arm. <laughs> I think you get my point. Reasoning with an immature child fails for two reasons. First, it's contrary to what the Bible says about child discipline. Second, disobedience is a matter of our old sin nature, which refuses to obey authority unless there are consequences to enforce that authority. This, of course, is a reminder, a biblical reminder to us as adults, that our first parents, Adam and Eve, were also told that there was something in the Garden of Eden that was a no-no. It was the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it's also good to remember that Eve was still in her innocence when she was tempted prior to having a sin nature. We normally think of temptation as yielding to sin because we frequently do that when the temptation comes along. But temptation is an attack. It's not the sin itself. The Bible tells us our Lord was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Our loving Heavenly Father had given Adam and Eve a no-no. 
And they chose to disobey him. And so he gave them a lasting penalty that has been passed down to us who are their descendants. Disobedience, sin, results in death. Or as Paul puts it, the wages of sin is death. The second word of command or word of permission that we probably learned as children was the word yes. We would be sitting in our high chair, we would point to something that we would want it. And if we didn't get it, we would start to fuss, we would throw something on the floor resulting in probably a slap on our little hand. And then we would demand it, give me or I want. Now, do you remember the next thing that your mother would say? I'm sure you remember her exact words. In fact, I think I can quote your mother, even if I never met her. The next words out of her mouth would be, say please. We want it, we point to it. And mama would say, say please. Now, those of you who have had multiple children know that some kids are more stubborn than others. Some continue to pout and fuss and demand. Others comply readily. The wise parent waits for obedience before granting the request. The parent wants the child to politely request rather than arrogantly demand with an attitude of authority and self-will. Children typically want to assume the position of authority rather than the position of being under authority. A command is the right of those in authority. A petition is the responsibility of those under authority. This again goes back to the biblical principle that God has the right and the authority to command us to obedience. We never have the right or authority to demand anything of God. Instead, we have the right to request or petition him for that which is good in his sight, leaving the final choice to him. We should never fuss or demand or pout when his answer is no or wait. A number of years ago, I ran across some teaching by a woman Bible teacher, which was, who is very popular here in the United States, and she was telling all of these women who follow her teachings and who buy her books and listen to her tapes and DVDs and CDs and all of that, that instead of coming and asking things of God, since we are children of the King, we can go in and demand it of Him. Dear friends, that misses all of Scripture by a very wide berth. What we see in Scripture is the privilege of coming and making our requests and our petitions made known. And then God, who sovereignly controls all things, granting those or denying them based on certain basic biblical principles, which we'll talk about in a moment. Just as our Heavenly Father has the right to command us to obey without first asking our approval with a request, even so, earthly parents have the right to command their children to obey without first running a request through their child's approval grid. When a child challenges a parent with the question, why? The appropriate response is, because I am your mother, or I am your father, and my authority is from God. You don't have to reason with the child to get the child's approval first. If you do that, you'll discover that you will waste an enormous amount of your life and time, and you will still end up with a rebellious child. The biblical way of raising the child, based on the way God raises us as his children, is to teach the child to say, please. This is the first basic principle of prayer and petition when we come into the presence 
of our Heavenly Father. That is, of course, followed by learning how to respond to the Heavenly Father when he grants our requests. So back to the parents. When we finally learned to say please and they gave us our request, what was the next sentence out of their mouths? And again, I can quote your mom and dad. Now say thank you. That again is based on what the Bible says should be our response to our Heavenly Father when he grants us our requests. That is the first great principle in the petitions of prayer. Let me explain. Prayer has at least four major divisions. There are many different words that are used in the Bible, but they generally fall under one of these four categories. Even the imprecatory prayers of David in the Psalms, where David is praying God's wrath on his enemies. That's a petition. That's one of the four types. The first that we need to remember and understand in prayer is confession of sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession of sin is essential if we would even get through the gates of heaven with our prayers. When our hearts and our hands are defiled by sin, that is not taken care of in the way that God has provided the gates of heaven for our other areas of prayer will not open. The second area is praise. We need to remember that this is verbal adoration of God for who he is. And there are many subheadings under prayer. There are more than 25 words that are used in scripture that deal with prayer and they fall under one of these four headings. The third area is thanksgiving. That is verbal adoration of God for what he has done. Praise deals with who he is. Thanksgiving deals with what he has done. And finally, of course, there is the area of petition. And that is where we make our requests made known to God. And if they are proper requests, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 34, that the Holy Spirit himself will phrase those requests in the language of heaven. He will help our infirmities because we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. And so the Holy Spirit takes those bumbling, stumbling, no matter how eloquent they are, petitions of ours to bring before the Father. And in verse 34, our Lord Jesus Christ likewise prays for us before the Father. And so as we look at the scripture, we discover that two of the main elements of prayer our praise and thanksgiving, the other confession of sin and petition. But what we focus on today, since this is Thanksgiving Sunday, are those areas of praise and thanksgiving. We need to learn as we come into the presence of God to say please. We, learn to, we need to learn to say thank you. That should be at the very core of our daily relationship with our Heavenly Father. The text for today clearly states these principles. Verse 30 says, I will praise the name of God with a song. Remember, praise deals with verbal expression and adoration of God for who he is. And here it is very instructive that it says, I will praise the name of God with a song. We are praising his name. Now those of you who were here with us last week know we began with the name of Jehovah, Yahweh. The name that God gives to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, which is where our studies have been taking us. The name that Jesus used 
When he said before Abraham was, I am, in Greek, ego emi, Yahweh in Old Testament Hebrew. The God of the Bible, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is also our creator, whom we will study as we look at that next name, Elohim. That is the God whom we praise and adore for who he is. Notice here in the text also something else. Praise precedes thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is mentioned at the end of this line, but praise comes first. We praise him for who he is because who God is determines what he will do and those are the things for which we thank him. Only the God of the Bible deserves praise because he is the only God who does that which is good. Some of you, perhaps in your youth in high school or college, read through Bullfinch's mythology. And in that you have various stories of the gods and goddesses of the ancient Greeks. I've also had the dubious privilege of reading some poetry from the Hittites translated out of Ugaritic and into Hebrew and then having to write a paper on it. That was a very difficult course. Believe me, friends, that is not poetry that you want to read. The gods of the Hittites were the most gross and vile beings, demons of course, but expressed in this language of Ugarit, the language of Rashamra, the central hill at Bogaz Khoi, where the Hittite library was located, the most vile kind of gods. They were not good gods. But the reason we praise the God of the Bible and the reason that he alone deserves our praise and thanksgiving is because he is the only God who does that which is good. As we mentioned a moment ago, notice we are to praise his name. We are to praise his name. And we put name with a little S in parenthesis after it because the name of God has many different facets to it with the many names that he is given in scripture. Every one of those names describes a specific aspect of his character. So when we praise him, we are adoring him for the character that is manifested in his names. Each aspect of his character is worthy of praise. Each aspect of his character reveals who he is. Each aspect of his character results in specific benefits to those who are his children. Praise is essential in both worship and prayer. Knowing and understanding the names of God enables us to more adequately give him the praise that he alone deserves. The corollary to that is, if you are not daily praising God for who he is, your prayer life is truncated and you are still in the infancy of your spiritual growth, or perhaps in the atrophy of your spiritual life. Notice the second aspect of praise in verse 30. We are to praise God with song. When we come in to this place of worship, why do we sing? Because we are to praise God with song. The Bible specifically tells us that. You see, our God is a musical God. Zephaniah three seventeen says, The Lord thy God, that's Jehovah thy Elohim, in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. Now listen to the next three phrases. Because these are things that God is doing. Yes, we know God is in our midst. Yes, we know he is mighty. Yes, we know he has provided salvation. But listen to the next three things it tells us about him. He will rejoice over thee with joy. Just as a mother holds 
a baby in her arms and looks at that baby and her heart is filled with joy and she rejoices over this child. Jehovah, our Elohim, will joy, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. The picture of calm, gentle care. Infinite love for those who are his children. Now listen to the last phrase. He will joy over thee with singing. Those of you who have been moms or dad, do you remember when you were holding those tiny babies? Oh, how I remember it. How different they are now. <laughs> but how I remember when they were those tiny little children. And many times as I was sitting there in the middle of the night, rocking a baby back and forth, and Judy the same, my heart would be filled with joy and gladness. There would be rest. There would be peace in my heart. And I would sing to that tiny child. God is a musical God. God sings over us with joy. And how are we to praise him? We praise him, we respond with song. That is why it is such an essential element of worship, because we as a congregation together, as we sing his praise, we are praising him. And that comes even before Thanksgiving. God is not only a musical God, he created music. He created musical creatures, especially the moral beings of angels and men. What do we find the angels doing at the birth of Jesus Christ? They sang, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. God has created music for us to praise him. We find that only certain music is suitable for praising God, not anything goes. We spent several weeks talking about that type of music that is appropriate, biblical, for use in worship about two months ago. You know, there are people who would deny that truth at both ends of the spectrum, that music is to be used for praising God. Those who abuse the gift of music by following the devil's music and bringing that into the church. And those who want no music at all. This has been a problem in the churches for many years. Isaac Watts, I'm sure you're familiar with him, he uh, lived from 18, uh, 1674 to 1748. Had people in the congregation who didn't want to sing. And I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the great hymn, We're Marching to Zion. Come ye that love the Lord and let your joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord and thus surround the throne. Here we are standing and the picture is the sea of glass in the book of Revelation where we're standing around and singing praises to the Lamb. It's a magnificent picture. But you know what he wrote in verse 2? Verse 2, he denounced those sourpuss so-called Christians who refused congregational singing. Listen to what he wrote. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly king may speak their joys abroad. Do you understand that if you're a Christian, if you give praise to God, if your heart is filled with that praise, it will express itself externally in music. We praise him with song. The next phrase in our psalm today is, we'll magnify him with thanksgiving. We'll magnify him with thanksgiving. As you know, a psalm is a Hebrew song that has words that bring glory to God. Notice what thanksgiving does for God. It magnifies him. 
It makes God more real. It makes him bigger in the eyes of those who hear from our lips what he has done in our lives. When you give thanks, true thanks, not perfunctory thanks, but true thanks to God, what you do is you magnify him. The text says so. We'll magnify him with thanksgiving. You see, thanksgiving takes the focus off of us. Thanksgiving points to the greatness of God. Thanksgiving expresses the gratitude of our hearts for what he has done. Not merely what he has done for us, but what he has done. You think of all the things in history that God has done, and we can thank him for that. The scripture is replete with examples of what God has done. Praise is adoring him for who he is. Thanksgiving is adoring him for what he has done. And that's what we remember so much in this very special week of the year, though it should be our characteristic habit every day of the week, thanking him because it expresses the gratitude of our hearts for what he has done. It points to his greatness. Thanksgiving puts us in our proper place under authority. How many of you have ever known a teenager who is an ingrate? An unthankful, ungrateful, rebellious, nasty, I will do it my own way kind of a person. I think we've all known people like that. How many of you known Christians like that with their Heavenly Father? The teenager thinks that the world owes him a living. He thinks he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He thinks God is supposed to give him everything or his parents are supposed to give him everything on a silver platter. And when they don't, it's their fault, not his. We all know people like that, don't we? What do you think it is like to the Heavenly Father when after he has poured out upon us all the magnificent benefits that he has given to us when we respond with demands and with an ungrateful spirit. The Apostle Paul says that is the character quality of the pagans in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and following. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. That is, they didn't praise him. They didn't give thanks to him or acknowledge him for who he is. They glorified him not as God. That's who he is. Neither were they thankful. They didn't thank him for what he had done, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And you know the, the downhill slide from that point on as it goes through the rest of the chapter and says three times that God turned them over and God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do the things that are not convenient. And he lists the sins of sodomy. That's what happens to people who refuse to give God glory, they don't praise him, and who refuse to give him thanks for all that he has done. God turns them over to a reprobate mind. And that is the end result of it. And we see it here in our country growing by leaps and bounds in a country that has been more blessed by God than any other country in the world apart from ancient Israel. Oh, people, thanksgiving is a critical issue when it comes to God and from his perspective. Thanksgiving puts us in a state of humility. We are not self-made men. We are not self-sufficient men. We are not the ones who deserve the credit for what has been accomplished. It is God who deserves the credit and we stand in awe and amazement at what he has done. It tells us that we are to magnify him. We magnify him with thanksgiving. The more you look at what he has done in your life, the more you will be able to magnify him. Have you ever sat down and in a quiet moment, perhaps in a time of prayer and fasting, perhaps some place where you've 
gone off to be alone, and I trust that you have done this at least once in your life. You've gone off and you spent the day just with God. You took your Bible, you did not take your cell phone. You did not make it possible for other people to contact you and interrupt you. You went someplace alone just to meditate on God and his word. And you look back over your life. Now many people talk about having a flashback when they suddenly realize they might be dying in a moment. You know, they see a car accident coming and they're swerving and suddenly their mind brings up all the things of the past and it flashes in front of them. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where you deliberately sit and think back over your early childhood and your juvenile years and your teen years and your college years and your early adult years and all the way through your life. And yes, you will remember things that were sinful and if you hadn't confessed them before, take that opportunity to confess them and to let the blood of Christ cleanse your conscience as well as forgiving your sins. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Those unconfessed sins are the things that are still nagging your conscience. Those are the things that keep you from fully serving him as you should. But in the midst of that day of reflection and meditation upon God's word, the things that will come to your mind that he has done for you will fill your heart with such praise and gladness and songs will burst out of your lips. You can't help it if you're doing this. Dear friends, I, I encourage you, and I hadn't planned to say this here, but I encourage you sometime within the next two or three weeks, take one day for God like that. Take one day that you set aside and you don't have to tell anybody else about it. You set it aside and you pray and fast and read God's word specifically with the intent of finding out more about him who loved you. And if you want to love him, you want to find out more about him and you will be filled with praise as you learn more about him. And as you recall all the things that he has done in your life, you will begin to thank him with thanksgiving. Notice something else. When you magnify him with thanksgiving, there are some things that you will not be able to do. Note well, a complaining spirit is not a thankful spirit. A bitter spirit is not a thankful spirit. A proud spirit is not a thankful spirit. You remember that God killed the children of Israel in the wilderness when they complained ten times and were not thankful. You remember that God turned the reprobate over to their own lusts because they were not thankful. You remember that a bitter spirit in the book of Hebrews springing up will not only trouble you, but by it many will be defiled. That is not a thankful spirit that magnifies the Lord. Instead of magnifying the Lord, it defiles others. Thanksgiving. Notice the next verse, verse 31. Psalm 69, 31. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bullock that hath horns and hooves. Do you really want to please God? We hear it glibly said many times, oh, I, I really want to please the Lord. Do you really want to please God? Then you will have a heart that is first full of praise and then you will magnify God with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better. That's not that these other things didn't please the Lord. 
this is something that pleases him better than an ox or bullock that hath horns or hooves. He doesn't just mention a sheep or turtle doves or the meal offerings or something else in the Old Testament. The most expensive sacrifices of the Old Testament were an ox or a bullock. What pleases God even more than the most expensive sacrifice you could give him, the most expensive extravagant offering you could give him, what pleases him more is praise and thanksgiving. Praise and thanksgiving, you see, are considered a sacrifice by God. Listen to Hebrews 13, 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Here the author of Hebrews puts those two together for us again. Praise to God and thanksgiving. And did you notice also what it said? Giving thanks to his name. Here we are back again to the names of God. Praise and thanksgiving. Praise and thanksgiving. Praise and thanksgiving. Who God is determines what God will do. And what God does enables us to give him thanks. Who he is enables us to praise him. Our text tells us that God is even more pleased with this than with the required sacrifices of the Old Testament. The scribe who spoke with Jesus understood this, and Jesus told him that he was not far from the kingdom. In Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 39, Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's the Shema Yisrael from Deuteronomy 6.4. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. When you love God that way, when you understand his name, which Jesus refers to here, what is it going to result in your life? If you love him with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind, you're going to be filled with praise. You're going to be filled with thanksgiving. And the second is like it, namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, listen, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Precisely what Hebrews 13.5 said is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And here's how Jesus responded. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any questions. Our time is up, but I'll read those last few verses. The humble shall see this and be glad, and your heart shall live that seek God. You see, if you seek God, you're going to get to know him better. If you get to know him better, you're going to praise him. As you praise him, you begin to understand what he has done and you'll give him thanks. But to come that way, you have to come in humility, not in pride. The humble shall see this and be glad, and your heart shall live that seek God. You don't come as the arrogant rich man who demands... For the Lord heareth the poor and despiseth not his prisoners. And then he talks about the praise that all of creation gives. Let the heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moveth therein. For God will save Zion. We have praise from all of creation. Then we find what God is going to do, which is a matter of thanksgiving. For God will save Zion and will build the city of Judah that they may dwell there and have it in possession and then the last verse recaps where we began. The seed also of his servants shall inherit it, and they that love his name shall dwell therein. They that love his name. That brings us back to praise. 
which results in our understanding of what he has done and thanksgiving. And the cycle continues to go as we learn about him more and more and not only learn about him, but as we draw closer to him in personal fellowship and in love. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we pray that you will give us a yearning and an earnest desire to truly know you and your Son, Jesus Christ, the true and living God. Oh, Father, as we desire you, as we love you, as we seek you in humility, as we learn who you are, oh, who you really are, as your name declares it to us. Build our love. Fill our hearts with joy and singing and testimony of what you have done so that we might magnify you with thanksgiving. So that others who hear that testimony of what you, the living God, have done in our lives, they will be halted in their tracks, they will stop, they will pause, they will contemplate who you are. You are the great and mighty and majestic, eternal God, the God of love and power and justice and truth and holiness and righteousness, the God of our salvation, the God who daily loadeth us with benefits. Father, we praise you for who you are. We thank you, Father, for what you have done. Fill our hearts with true joy and gladness and song at this Thanksgiving season. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.